Amen. As you're being seated and keeping your uh, eyes fixed upon these early verses of Genesis, and in chapter 1, verse 2, particularly, we'll, we'll, we come to the second half of verse number 2, and it, it is there telling us, as we've already seen in the first half, that the earth was, this is the description, as God created the heavens and the earth, and then the attention, as we've noted, comes to the earth, and the earth was, this is the condition of the earth, before it is as you and I appreciate it and, and see it and, and, and live and breathe in it, it was, as the Bible describes, an uninhabitable condition. It was formless, it was void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, or the abyss, maybe is how your translation uses this, this, this description of, of what the Bible is doing for us. And we'll look closer at, 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 what, at what's following this this morning. And that is this, that the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Or as the New American Standard that I just read a moment ago says, was, was moving over the surface of the waters. And your translation may use that word hovering. Uh, it, it would not be an out of... Uh, a, a, a good translation, or it would be a credible translation to say that there was a there, that there is a a, a a mighty movement over the surface of the waters. That there there was a stirring. That there was, as the New American says, a moving over, or how the older translation says, a hovering over the surface of the waters. And the waters is being descriptive of what's just been said and spoken about, the formless and the void and the darkness that is over the surface of the earth. Again, now we'll, make, we'll make better understanding of this and we'll make, we'll make longer comments and observations of this when we begin to see that where God separates the waters and, 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 and separates the land masses and the forming of that. But at this moment, as it's being described as God's instructing Moses what to write concerning the creation, this is how God instructs Moses to, to, to instruct the people. This is how God does this. This is, how, this is what God was doing here. And so in the second verse, we're actually introduced to the, to the third person of the Trinity, which is beautiful because we get all three persons of the Trinity introduced to us in verse number one. We just don't know that, we, we don't know who the persons are yet. We know who, we, we know that there is this God, and in the Hebrew language, in verse number one, this word God is Elohim, and that Hebrew word Elohim is literally meaning a plural singular. It is, it is a being like you and I know nothing about. Prior to God revealing himself to us, and the nature in which he is, and, and how he relates to us, we would not have any way to comprehend that he was a triune being. But the very language of the, first, of the first verses of the Bible are tipping us to the right direction. That this God is, as Isaiah said, he's altogether different than you and I. And indeed he is, isn't he? And in the second verse, we're introduced specifically to the Spirit of God or we, as we would see this, we would understand the Holy Spirit, the, the, He is hovering, He is moving over the surface of the wind. A credible way of translating this could well mean a mighty wind hovering. There, there is a mighty wind over the surface of the earth. The Spirit of God was causing a mighty wind over the surface of the waters. Now, those of you who are robust readers of the Bible, your, your mind begins to trigger whenever you, when you read about things that, that the Bible uses to describe the work of the Holy Spirit. In one of the places your mind should at least land to or point to would be in the book of Acts. And so, of course, page number one is easy to get back to, isn't it? So I could say keep your finger there, but I'll just, just remember we're, we're on page number one. You can look at Acts chapter 2 and you would hear the, the way that the, the Word of God describes the movement of the Holy Spirit 
on the early days of the church. And notice how similar it is to the description of what, we are, what we've just read about the work of the Holy Spirit over the formless and the void condition of the earth. The unfinished creation. This is Acts chapter 2, verse 2. And suddenly, there came from heaven a noise. And I think it's important to note that. It's the noise like a violent, rushing wind. The sound of a mighty, rushing wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. So you notice in Acts chapter 2, verse 1, Verse 2, this, it's the noise. It's like, it doesn't mean there was a rushing wind that came through the room that blew the, 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 the curtains off of the windows and the side of the open building or the open house. But this is what was the sound of. And, and note this as the, as the historian Luke continues to report about this from the eyewitnesses who saw this, who heard this, that in verse number 4, or verse number 3, that there appeared to them tongues of fire distributing themselves and they rested on each one of them. In verse 4, and they were filled, all, all of those who were in the house were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. There were Jews living in the, in, li, who were living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation, under heaven, verse 6, and when this sound, that's back, it's pointing us back to verse number 2, the noise, that of like a violent rushing wind, so verse 6, when this sound occurred, the crowd came together and were bewildered because each one of them were hearing them speak in their own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, why are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that each of them in, uh, in our own language to which we were born? We we're hearing them, verse 8 again, and how is it that we each hear them in our own language in which we were born? I just use Acts chapter 2 to help us understand that what we're reading about in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 and verse 2 is, is actually not all that unfamiliar it's very consistent that the work of the Holy Spirit this is is somewhat unexplainable it's somewhat hard to comprehend isn't it that the how is it possible that what you and I know as the earth and what we know of this of the solar system that we are in and what we know about the universe as little of what we know about this glorious universe how is it possible that this was formless at one time that this was void that this was covered in darkness. And yet there was this work of the Holy Spirit that was giving oversight to and was being used as the former. As we know from John chapter 1, that it's Jesus who's doing the creating. And we're, we're seeing here both in Genesis chapter 1 and really from the aid of, of the historian Luke in chapter 2 of the book of Acts, that we're seeing that there is a a very beautiful work that the Holy Spirit is doing in what would otherwise be undescribable. Now, this is not permission for the church to think that everything undescribable is the work of the Holy Spirit. This is not permission for the church to think that everything that's crazy and lunatic or out of mind or, or, or just seen by the world as, listen, that's just crazy talk. You, you church people are just filled with, as the early church would even sometimes be accused of being drunk with wine, and the Scripture clearly wants to note that, no, they are not drunk as you might suppose so. But rather, they are filled by the Holy Spirit. Now, that's difficult to comprehend. Well, we do need to see, though, that God, even though there is and what appears to be some chaos, that God is actually Lord of of all. Now, one might sit, and I don't mean to, to linger too much on the front end of verse number two, because really the emphasis here is on the second part this morning, and that is the Spirit of God moving over the surface of the waters. And, 
And this description of the waters is just to help us understand. I mean, it is, it, 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 it's clear in our understanding because the earth, even though everything that we live on is dry land, the earth is predominantly water. And the, uh, the amount of water that's under the earth and the amount of water that's in the oceans is just amazing. And so the description of this is very helpful to, for us to understand that this, this earth, this, which is really describing of dry land, and the description of it here is it's formless, it's void, and, and there is darkness over the surface, surface of the deep or the abyss, and then be, to be described that the Spirit of God is moving over the surface of the waters. So we, we'll, we'll see this, and we'll, we'll definitely want to linger on this, especially as we get into uh, day two of the creation, which, is, which could potentially be months down the road. But this morning, the emphasis here is what appears to be chaotic is under the control of the Almighty God. And this particularly being credited to the work of this third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. Well, we could also see here that Moses, who I am, I am well convinced is the author of the Pentateuch, all five books of the Pentateuch, or all as we would understand it, the one book of the Pentateuch, uh, but the one-fifth here from Genesis, and then each book, as we see it divided in our, in our Bibles, each of them making up the totality of the Pentateuch. There, there is essentially the bookends in the Scripture of the work of the Holy Spirit moving amongst all things. Here in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, is the Spirit of God is moving over the surface of the waters. If you see it in Deuteronomy, if you're, if you're, if you're quick on the draw, certainly you're welcome to make way to Deut Deuteronomy chapter 32 with me. Let me read the text in Deuteronomy 32, verse 11, and see here that there is a description of the work of the Holy Spirit at the beginning of the Pentateuch and at the close of the Pentateuch. Verse 11 of Deuteronomy chapter 32, like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that moves or hovers over its young. He spreads his wings and caught them and carried them on his pinions. So there is this language of the movement of a mighty rushing wind. And again, Moses is using the, the illustration of an eagle at the close of the Pentateuch and that work and that care of, of the young eaglet in the nest. And he's hovering, he's protecting, he's, he's got his eye upon the nest and the young that are in it. And there is this movement as he flies over it. And as those young ones get restless in their nest, high perched above, uh, perhaps on the edge of a cliff or in a tall tree, and that young eaglet decides to try either by force of the of, of the parent eagle or because the nest has just grown too crowded for all of the eaglets to remain of it and is, is, is taken immediately to flight school. And there is this, this, this idea is given to us that this is what the Holy Spirit is doing as Moses comes to the close. And we know that this, is this because last week we looked at Deuteronomy 32 and that Deuteronomy 32 is essentially it's the song of Moses, and Moses is giving the history lesson of the world, and that in particular to the nation of Israel in all that God has brought them through. And this, a description that even to the people of God, that it sometimes seems pretty chaotic. It sometimes see, seem as though there's no order to them, but there is a kindness of God that is hovering over them. It's, they're not blow, it's not blowing you over. It's not causing you to not be able to stand. It is essentially just, it is present. The Holy Spirit Himself present among you, present with you, a, a, a help in time of very present danger. And this is the work of the Holy Spirit. So we see this, the, the, that, that He picks, the eagle swoops down and picks up the floundering eaglet out of the, out of the nest and, and, ca and catches him on his pinions. That's, that's just to describe where those, those, those... It actually describes both 
both wings and everything related to it, but in the solid spot on the back of the eagle's back where those wings come together. But it would even include the, the feathers that cause the flight of the eagle. He carries them on his pinions. Do, or, Genesis chapter 1, verse 2 can, can, can you? Do you have, the, do you have the, the willpower? Do you have the desire to see that what God is doing both at the beginning and the conclusion of the Pentateuch is to saying there is a beautiful work of the Holy Spirit. And that what appears to be chaotic, what appears to be full of chaos, formless and void and darkness over the surface of it all, but yet the good news is that none of it is outside of the, of the purview of the Spirit of God. And that He is moving. He is he's like he, he could be described as a mighty rushing wind. Or as we read in, in, in Acts chapter 2, verse 2, as the people who are in the city heard what sounded like a mighty rushing wind. Or those who were in the room heard the sound of a what what would what would what they would describe to be that of a mighty rushing wind and of course it's described to us this is this was the spirit of god and that he is essentially and uh, very practically at the end of the pentateuch we see that he is actually carrying his people on the pin, on his pinions on the back of his wings which by the way would be as well reason for us to have again understanding of how Isaiah the prophet would describe so much about the work of God as that of an eagle. And so back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, that word, that phrase, the Spirit of God. Uh, this is the Spirit of Elohim, if you will. The Spirit of the triune God. The Spirit of the, sing, of the plural singular. The work of God is rested there upon the upon the, the pinions. All, all of what God has done is resting here. It's, it's, it's not out of control. It's, it's just as God has designed it to be so. So the description of the first moment of creation is what, what one would like to think is pretty reckless. It's described as the abyss or the di- or the deep. The dark, the formless, the void. There's no way to describe. You can't, you, you, you couldn't by these descriptions make any determination of how wide it was or how deep it was or how thick it was or how light and fluffy it was. It, it, it's just described to us that this is the condition of the moment out of verse number one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. As hard as it may be to, to, for you to comprehend the void of the earth, the formlessness of the earth, or the deepness of the abyss, or how much water there actually was in the creation of the molecules and the matter in which God created, this much is certain, and this especially, for boys and girls, hear this especially this morning. As much as, you, as your mind will want to think about that, and by the way, Don't be afraid to think about it. But be certain of this, that whenever you end your thinking upon how is this possible, that you end on this. God created the heavens and the earth. Be settled there while you think. Be settled there when you hear professors at your universities. Be settled there when you hear we should move this to the junior high or to the grade school level as well in your government schools. Be certain that when you hear them question the God who created the heavens and the earth that you know better because the Bible that is the Word of God, it is the inerrant Word of God, it is the sufficient Word of God, and that this God who is outside of time, outside of space, outside of this universe, created the heavens and the earth. The description as it is in this first moment. And I think that's how we should understand verse number 2. That we're within, few, we're within a few moments of God creating the heavens and the earth. And that it's, to be, that it's described in this manner. All of the molecules in all of the universe are present at this moment. Not because they are eternal, but because the eternal God 
created them. Before this, there was nothing. There was no molecule, this molecule and this molecule, and they come together and make this particular atom or this particular, this particular matter or this particular uh, gas or this particular physical matter or liquid. Before any of that comes about, God created all that would cause that to come about. And so it would make sense that it would be described within the first moments of creation that it would be described as a void, formless, and a dark covering the abyss uh, uh, over the surface of the earth. There is the Spirit of God moving, hovering, controlling, creating, causing, and forming. This is an uninhabited condition. There's no, there's no reason that anyone should assume that the very first moment of the creation that it was just as it is because we actually have multiple days of the creation narrative to learn that God will be an active creator in the coming days. This is quite amazing, isn't it? It actually helps us even to understand that when we think about how we understand life in this day, we, we think of time, we think of things in, the, in, in increments of time. And all of that because there's a sun that, that, that we use as a, as a governing clock of the days and the nights, the moon at the night time that governs the night as we'll learn uh, of what God does in the placement of each of these things. But even before there's a sun created, that there is movement. Even before there is time, as we would understand time to be, there is mo movement is one of the things that describes and that you understand that there is, that there is actually time moving. It, the, the, the amount of time it takes me to walk from here to the back of this room is necessary for there to be time because uh, especially the older I get, it, it, takes, it just takes time to get from here to there. And I was speaking with uh, Brother Steve this morning when I came in, and I was blessed to hear that Steve was saying he has no pains today. And I'm thinking, oh, oh boy, you know, the older I get, the more pains I've got. And the more it takes, the longer it takes. So there's a stretching out of time. There is a, 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 an elongation of it. And you have time. You can measure that because you know what a second is. You, we even know what a nanosecond is in the, in the measurements of time. You have to have these things in order to have movement. You can't have movement if you don't have time. So there, there will be among those things, boys and girls, where your mind will think, then how is it possible that there is time existing in days one, in day two, in day three, and there is no, there is no sun? You see, even... God in the beginning of the universe is establishing movement and space. Again, where we don't know how deep the abyss was, we don't know how, we, we, we don't even know how dark the darkness was, other than, listen, let's just say, if, if you know what darkness is, you know what darkness is. When, when there's no light anywhere around to put any ability for your eye to see form or shape, darkness is what darkness is. There is no light present to see. So even before this, the Spirit of God is described to us as hovering. Even though you couldn't have seen it. But let's, let's also remember this. The earth is uninhabitable at this moment. So there is no human observers of this. But the way God describes it is as though you could observe it. If you could have been there, you would have observed even though it's this formless creation, even though there's a void in it, there's this deep abyss and the, and the darkness has covered all of it, you would have noted that there was a movement of the Holy Spirit. There would be a... You, 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 would, not, you would not be able to describe it as anything but that. I think that's what the writer, that's what, that's what Moses is being instructed by God to pin for us to understand that God is active. And for us to describe God as active, we have to have an understanding that there is time, that there is space, that there is movement. There is time and there is movement. Again, the language of the Bible helps us. 
And we're not going to dig into verse number 3, but notice what the first word of verse number 3 is. It's a description of time. This is not just some random, unidentifiable length of time. And we're going to see this in the, in the actual descriptions of the days. And for us to think that this moment of the first void and formless moments of God's creation, that it somehow, that God caused it to last for millions or billions of years before He calls all of this day one. We can't do that with Scripture. Because the Scripture has not told us to look at Genesis chapter 1 as anything but literal. So verse chapter 3, excuse me, chapter 1, verse 3, the marker of time, after it's described that the world, that the earth is void, that is formless, and that, that there is darkness over it, and then the Spirit of God is moving over the surface of the abyss, the, wa the deep waters. Then verse number 3 uses that word, then. Meaning it followed what you just read. It, so by the markers of time, this couldn't have happened simultaneously, and this couldn't have happened before. It had to happen in the following sequential movement of God's creation. So there is a marker of time. Now we don't really know exactly how many moments have passed by, but there will be, no doubt, a, a movement of time that is taking a, a movement of action of what God is doing. He's described as hovering or moving over the surface of the abyss. And now described then in verse number 3, then the Lord God said, let there be light. And we'll look at that, Lord willing, next week. We can hardly make any progress out of Genesis chapter 1 without ending up again in the book of Isaiah. There, there is so many helpful things that the prophet Isaiah tells us about the creation of the earth. It's, it's as though I need to take a pause from preaching the book of Genesis and go and walk us through the book of Isaiah again. Because it's so helpful. So, we're not going to take a long pause. But go with me to Isaiah chapter 44. Now keep, now, now, now keep this in mind. The audience that's here in the prophet Isaiah, these are a people who are on the brink of going into Babylonian captivity. So they have, they've experienced everything in the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch is closed as far as the historic description of everything in the Pentateuch from the beginning of creation, from the beginning of the created universe to the exit from the Egyptian captivity. All of that is finished. The historic narrative of the people of God is recorded in that narrative history. And then what we have in Isaiah is a, is, is a prophet warning the people who have largely disobeyed the God who rescued them time and time and time and time again. So for the sake of the benefit of both time, making mention of time, and for the benefit of the text, I, I want to read large blocks of the text from Isaiah 44, 45, and 46. Now in my mind, I'm saying I'm not going to read all of those three chapters, but when I'm finished, you'll have to make the determination whether I did or didn't. Um, I, I have certain blocks that I know I want to read, and uh, then will, will we read them all? Well, let's just find out. Let's, let's, we, and how will it be of, of value to us? Because we'll be under the Word of God. The Spirit of God moving among us from the revealed Word of God. Isaiah chapter 44. Listen, listen to how Isaiah speaks to a people who should have known better because of what God had done by telling them who He was. Chapter 44, verse 1 and following. But now listen, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel whom I have chosen. Thus says the Lord who made you and formed you from the womb, who will help you, 
Do not fear, O Jacob, my servant, or you, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. For I have poured out water on a thirsty land and streams on a dry ground. I will pour out... Who? I will pour out my Spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. And they will spring up among the grass like poplars by streams of water. This one will say, I am the Lord's. And that one will, will call on the name of Jacob. And another will write on his, on his hand, Belonging to the Lord. And will name Israel's name with honor. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and His Redeemer, Israel's Redeemer and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. This is the language of Revelation. This is the language of Genesis. I am the first and I am the last. And there is no God besides me. Who is like me? Let him proclaim and declare it. Yes, let him recount to me in order from the time that I established the ancient nation, speaking specifically of the nation of Israel, and let them declare to them the things that are coming and the events that are going to take place. Do not tremble and do not be afraid. Have I not long since announced it to you and declared it? And you are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? Or is there any raw, any other rock? I know of none. Verse 9, those who fashion the graven image are all of them futile and their precious things are of no profit. Even their own witnesses fail to see or know so that they will be put to shame. Who has fashioned a god or cast an idol to no profit? Behold, all his companions will be, will be put to shame. For the craftsmen themselves are like men. Let them all be assembled themselves. Let them all assemble themselves and let them stand up. Let them tremble and let them together be put to shame. The man shapes iron into a cutting, into a cutting tool and does his work over the coals, fashioning it with hammers and working it with a strong arm. He also gets hungry and his strength fails. He drinks no water and becomes weary. Another shapes wood. He extends a measuring line and the outlines of it with red chalk. He works it with the planes and outlines it with the compass and makes it like that of a, of a, in the form of a man, like the beauty of man, so that it may sit in a house. Surely he cuts the cedars for himself and he takes the cypress and the oak and, the, and he raises it to him, for himself among the trees of the forest and he plants a fir and the rain makes it to grow. Then it becomes something for a man to burn. So he takes one of them and he, and he warms himself. He also makes a fire to bake bread and he also makes a god and worships it and he makes it a graven image and falls down before it. Half of it he burns in the fire, and over the half he eats the meat of the roast, and the roast, uh, uh, and he roasts a roast, and it's and is satisfied. He also warms himself and says, "Aha! I am warm. I have seen the fire. Behold, the rest of it he makes into a god, his graven image. He falls down before it and he worships." He also prays to it and says, Deliver me, for you are my God. They do not know, verse 18, nor do they understand, for he has, has smeared over their eyes so that they cannot see and their hearts so that they cannot comprehend. No one recalls, nor is there knowledge or understanding to say, I have burned half of it in the fire and also have baked bread over its coals, and roast. I roast meat and eat it. Then I make the rest of it into an abomination. I fall down before the block of wood. He feeds on ashes. A deceived heart has turned him aside, and he cannot deliver himself, nor say, is there not a lie in my right hand? You, you obviously following along what's happening here that 
Isaiah the prophet is speaking to a people who, who have completely forgotten who God is. They've taken their eye off of Him. And they've put their eye upon their own abilities, on their own capacities, on their, on their own innovativeness. And, the, and he describes everything that they make. And everything they make is from something that God made. And everything that God made, God made from nothing. And so, whose image will you worship is, is at one level the question that, is, that Isaiah is bringing before them. God's already told them in verse 8 that, listen, I, I am the Lord your God and I'm telling you there is no other God. And, and he's, he's at least being fair enough with him to say, listen, it's not that I'm trying to keep you from other gods. It's that there are no other gods. And if there were other gods, then it would be right for me to tell you about these other gods. But there are no other gods. This God who created from nothing is the God that, you, that has delivered you and has put His name upon you and has put His Spirit in you to move you to obey Him and to follow Him. And look, look at what you've done. You've gone and worshipped something other than God. This is, the, this is the great indictment of all of the world from the fall of Adam to the judgment of Revelation. You can, hardly, you can hardly move anywhere in Scripture and not see God warning the people about what God they're worshiping. And so before us today is God remi reminding us of who He is. I would move your attention to the 45th chapter of Isaiah. Listen to a bit here. What God is doing is He's telling us He's going to raise up a man by the name of Cyrus. He names him and he appoints him and he anoints him to be a deliverer of sorts for the people. This is chapter 45 of Isaiah. Thus says the Lord. And by the way, notice if in your reading of the Bible, notice how often the Word of God says the Lord says. And notice what follows after it and then find that it happens the way God said that it would happen. Whom I have taken out, who I've taken by the right hand, this Cyprus, I've taken by the right hand to subdue nations before him and to loose the loins of kings and to open doors before him so that gates will not be shut. There's the language of the book of Revelation, isn't it? Revelation chapter 3, by way, in, in particular. Verse 2 of chapter 45 I will go before you, and I will make rough places smooth, and I will shatter the doors of bronze and cut down the iron bars and I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hidden wealth of the secret places so that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who calls you by your name. Speaking of Cyrus, speaking to him and about him. For the sake of Jacob, my servant, and Israel, my chosen one, I, I have also called you by your name and have given you a title of honor. Though you have not known me, I am the Lord and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I will gird you, though you have not known me, that men may know from the rising to the setting of the sun that there is no one besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other the one forming light and creating darkness, causing well-being and creating calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. The work of the Holy Spirit moving... You have the language of, 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 of Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. The Holy Spirit moving, causing... We have the, the language of the Bible where... The, where men may make plans by their own, but it is the movement of the Lord that causes the stream to, to go where the stream would go. It is not man who forces anything in the eternal. It is, this is a description of the mighty God. This is not just philosophical. This is theological. Verse 8. The movement of the Holy Spirit again. Drip down, O heavens, from above, and let the clouds pour down righteousness. Let the earth open up and salvation bear fruit and righteousness spring up with it. I, the Lord, have 
created it. Woe to the one who quarrels with his Maker. An earthenware vessel among the vessels of earth. Will the clay say to the potter, what are you doing? Or the one who... Or the one thing you are making say, he has no hands. Woe to him who says to his father, what are you begetting? Or to a woman, to what have you given birth? Thus says the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, and His Maker, Israel's Maker, ask me about the things to come concerning my sons, and you shall commit to me the work of my hands. It is I who made the earth and created man upon it. I stretched out the heavens with my hands, and I ordained all their host. I have aroused him in righteousness, and I will make all his ways smooth. And he will build my city and will let my exiles go free without any payment or reward, says the Lord of hosts. We're reading about God telling us this is the work of the Holy Spirit. This is what God is doing. He's moving over what appears to be rather chaotic. But yet He is charting the path. He's creating the way. He's establishing the the habitation for man to dwell in to give glory to God. Perhaps your life feels somewhat chaotic this morning. You say, well, there's, there's no way, there's no possible way that the Holy Spirit is any part of this chaotic nature of my life. And it's possible that you have been making a God for yourself and you're finding out why your life is so chaotic. But look closely, dear friend. If God can cause Cyprus, or Cyrus, a a man who knows not God, to be used of God to direct His people, God can even use your chaotic situation to drive you to know Him. The work of the Holy Spirit is moving in your life today. Now, be careful that you don't interpret it the way you want to interpret it. Don't make a God for yourself. Don't say, don't put words in God's mouth. If you're going to ever say God says something to you, you need to be sure that it's from the Word of God. Be careful that you do not put words and cause blasphemous words to come off your mouth by saying God said to do this and to do that and to to go here and to go there. You in your life, realize that much of the chaos and much of the trouble that you're currently in is due to bad decisions on your own behalf. But glory be to God! He takes the bad and He takes the uncontrollable and He uses it for the good of those who are called according to His purposes. This is how God takes what you have made into a chaotic mess and unexplainable circumstance and situation. Isaiah is telling us, stop being like all the other nations of the world who make their own gods. Portions of this out of chapter 44, chapter 45, chapter 46 especially. I'm not going to go and read, and read anything in chapter 46 this morning, but for the sake of understanding what's going on, God is saying everyone is so busy about making a God for themselves, and you know what they have to do every time that God does nothing for them? They have to excuse Him off, or explain Him away, or consider that He's grown deaf and old, and He's old-fashioned, and we need to create a new God. Or the reason that your God can't move from point A to point B, well, the Bible describes the Almighty, the living God, as moving over the surface of the abyss. He is actually moving, and this before there's any man created. This is a God who has movement. And Isaiah is describing a people who make a God out of gold or iron or wood. And you know what they have to do to get that God to move? They have to place him in a cart and they have to drag him from point A to point B. Now you tell me, what God do you want leading your life? Do you want the God who moves Himself hovering and caring for like an eagle over the nest? Or do you want a God 
that you're going to perpetually create in your own mind again and again for every circumstance and for every situation, for every pitiful circumstance you create out of your disobedience to God. What God do you want? The God you have to put in a cart and drag behind you? Or do you want the God, the Creator of the universe? I say today, as, as Joshua would say, as he looks at the nation who will eventually completely turn against this living God, Joshua would say, as for me and my house, we will serve the living God. We will serve the God who moves. We will, we will serve the God who creates. We will serve the God who is worthy to tell us how to live righteous lives. That God I will follow. Done are the days of the lives of men where we say we follow the gods we have to drag behind us. Rise up today, O church, and follow the living God. Repent of your sins today. Turn from your wicked ways. And look, the Creator of the universe, He's caring for you like a mother eagle cares for her, her, her eaglets in the nest. And carries you on her pinions for safety and for well-being. For the glory of God. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. What will you do this day? First, what God are you following? And then be honest enough to say you're not following it at all. You're dragging Him behind you. And then today, will you not repent of your sins? Repent of creating a God that you have to drag behind you in a wagon and begin following the living God. Repent and believe the Gospel. Jesus the Christ, the Redeemer of sinners, the Redeemer of those who forget their God, the Redeemer of those who make their own gods, the Redeemer of those who act independent of God or think they can, only to find that they cannot and should not. If that's you today, repent of your sins and turn to God. Now, for those of you who follow the Lord Jesus Christ, may you look with even deeper eyes. May you look with even greater intensity. May you look and, and live with joy. Even if you find yourself today with somewhat of a, of a chaotic circumstance around you. You've just gotten word of some kind of a crippling disease. You've gotten word of a sickness. You've gotten word of, uh, of some kind of, uh, of a hardship inside of your household. There's no better place today. There's no safer place for you than this. Than to be in the, on the pinions of God. Giving care and attention to every moment of your life. It is good that God has not put any pause on time, even before He created time. For the glory of God today, come to Christ and live.